ladies at the back there. And, um, that little baby reminds me of a story of Fulton Sheen that some of you heard. You know, one yeah. time Fulton Sheen was saying that he was talking, and while he was talking and talking, the baby started to cry. And of course, the mother picked up the baby and started to leave. Mm -hmm. And Fulton she said, oh, please don't leave. The baby is not bothering me. Mm -hmm. And the mother said, I know, but you're bothering the baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, on that note, I'd like to begin uh, today's presentation. So the next four, the next four sessions will be on an Eastern approach to, uh, uh, to uh, hope and healing. And what I'd like to begin today is on... Um, you know, elements of Hinduism, that is like, a, that is the foundation of all the other major uh, religions or spiritual paths that developed in the East. All right? So, when we talk about Hinduism and we talk about Eastern spirituality, part of our collective unconsciousness in the East, we begin with the story of the elephant and the six blind men. You know, you know the story. So each one holds a different part of the elephant and tries to describe the whole elephant. So, in the East, we know that we do not have the whole elephant. So we are always looking around other cultures, other religions, other people, for different parts of the elephant. And, and also, we feel very comfortable with other parts of the elephant. So, when I was growing up, we celebrated all the Hindu festivals with no problem. The Buddhists, we, 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 we related with them. Eid, we would all wait for this Ramadan to get over because the food was <laughs> great. So, the, so we, we interacted with Zoroastrians and they would all wait for Christmas. They have no difficulty in coming to our churches and attending our programs, our, our services, with no problem. And you know, of course, there are some strong, solid Catholics that will say, only Catholics can come to communion. You know, the rest of you, please sit where you are. I heard one of the best announcements in India, you know, the last time I was there, before I came, this was at a shrine where like 70% of the people at that Eucharist were non-Christians. So the priest gets up and he says, <coughs> communion, we believe this is the body and blood, this is the body and blood of Jesus. If you believe that you're receiving Jesus, you're welcome to come. And you all came. You know, like we go to their temples and we receive their prasad. You know, it's not the same as communion, you know, it's different, but it has the same effect as communion. So, so coming from India, we have no difficulty in adapting, in adjusting, and being part of different cultures, different religions, different... Uh, so that's the elephant and the sex blind men. Uh, the second thing we also, part of the, part of the foundation of Eastern spirituality, is pilgrimage. We are always on, you know, we have the word yatra. Yatra is not just, thank you. So yatra is not just journey, but yatra is a pilgrimage. See, I like pilgrimage better than journey. Why? Because journey has a destination. Once you arrive, you're done. A pilgrimage, once you, once you stop, you're no longer a pilgrim. So a pilgrim is forever, forever moving on, moving on, growing. There's never an end. And we've got two kinds of, you know, we may not have food to eat, but in India, we all travel to holy places, to shrines, and to all these different places, you know, because we are pilgrims. And in every one of the Eastern tradition, pilgrimage is big. Now the pilgrimage is not just the outward pilgrimage where we go to visit places, but there's also a continual inner pilgrimage where we go into ourselves to find a deeper and deeper meaning 
of who we are and what is life all about and our deeper relationship with God. Okay? All right. Having said that, how many gods are there in Hinduism? What do you think? Lots of them. In fact, there are 330 million gods in Hinduism. You know, we are a rich culture. How many gods are there in Christianity? Oh, poor people. Oh, three. Okay, three, three. Okay, we got three. All right. Well, Christianity has got many more gods than three. In fact, there are 150,000 Christian gods. Because there are 150,000 Christian denominations in this world today, each one of them claiming monopoly over God and, have, and deciding their own theology of salvation. You know? So yes, so we've got 330 million gods, but if you've listened to me, if you've heard me, I tell my students, don't you ever, ever say that Hinduism is polytheistic. Hinduism is more monotheistic than any other religion. Because what are the 330 million gods? There are 330 million expressions of experiences of one god. Hinduism believes in one god. And so when you talk about hope and healing, we've got 330 million ways of expressing and living hope and healing. You know, so none of those gods is God. But there are 330 million ways, expressions of experiences of one God. Who is God in Hinduism? which of course Buddhism will pick up and, and Islam will pick up later. Like, who's God and, and, and who's, who's the Hindu God? The Hindu God is Tat. How do we define God in Hinduism? There are two ways. One is Neti Neti. Neti Neti is not this, not this. So, is God Father? Like I told you, if you're from India, our heads are like, you know, wired differently. <laughs> because this is the Eastern way. It is yes and no, yes and no. You know, you cannot do that. Not most of you cannot do it. Some of you, like, if you've been with me t for too long, you're probably, you, you, you're ruined for life. So, so, yes, so it is God is and God is not. Now, that is not only in Hinduism. Thomas Aquinas says, God is known by what God is not. God is known by what God is not. So whatever you say about God, that's not God. You know, is God Father? Yes, no. Is God Mother? Yes, no. Who is God? God is that. Tat Tvam Asi. Tat Tvamasi is the Sanskrit word, a Sanskrit phrase that says, that which is and that you are. It's powerful. See? See, see the little kid gets it. <laughs> so that which is and that you are. Just think about that. That which is and that you are. Which means that God is that and you are that. So I find my identity in the divine. In the divine. I told you the third chapter in Exodus, uh, chapter 3, when Moses asked God, who should I say sent me? You know what God said? I am that. I am. Not I am who am. The literal translation is, I am that I am. Now that, just think about it, is beyond God. It's beyond the divine. It just is. So in Hinduism, or in the Eastern tradition, 
in the Eastern tradition, God is that. And you and I find our identity in that. So God and I are not one, God and I are not two. So whatever happens to one of us affects the rest of us. So when we talk about hope and healing, we need to keep this in mind. So if we if we have if we got prejudice against a group of people, we are depriving ourselves and cheating ourselves of a whole part of ourselves. So if we keep some people away, we are we are cut, we are depriving ourselves of that which is my essence. My essence. Okay? So this is a wonderful, wonderful spirituality for hope and healing. You know, it's very different from the dualistic understanding of hope and healing. Dualism is where God is the great other and I'm here. You know, in dualism there is differences between one group and another group and there's also scope for hierarchy. In non-dualism, there is no hierarchy. We are all in this together. Together. Not one, not two. You and I are not one, but you and I are not two. God and I are not one, but God and I are not two. Now, is this Catholic? Well, at least it is St. Ignatius. You know, and Ignatius probably wasn't Catholic. At least in his, he, he was Catholic. He's a Catholic saint. But he was caught by the Inquisition at least five or six times because of his theology that was not very Catholic. And Ignatius' theology is also non-dualistic. You know? So ultimately, the goal of our life is to become one with the divine essence, with that like the rays of the sun and the sun, the waters of the fountain and the fountain. So there are no rays without the sun. The rays have the identity only as being part of the sun. And if you haven't understood that, Ignatius says, think about the fountain. There's no fountain without water, and water has its identity only as being part of the fountain. Therefore, there is no you until, unless we find our identity in the divine essence. <clears throat> now again, you know, God for Ignatius was not Father, Son, and Spirit. God for Ignatius was the divine essence. So it was not even God. There is, there is, there is something, there is God beyond God. You know, if you could think about that, you and I will keep growing in, a, in, in leaps and bounds in our spiritual life, in our life with one another, and in our, you know, in, in everything. There is God beyond God. And we need to be able to get a hold of that. Okay? So, and for, 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 in, for the, in the East, God is that. That. You know? And you and I are... I want to share with you one little thing that happened to me. Hi! <laughs> what? Something that happened to me just about, um, about a week a week ago, I was with a Jewish rabbi, and this rabbi, I told him, get me the Bible and read it to me in Hebrew, word by word, text, go, go through, through this text. And which text do you think I asked him to go through? The third chapter of Genesis, the fall of Adam and Eve. That's my favorite passage of the whole of the Old Testament, because that will either make or break our Christianity. We, we, it will be totally different based on how we respond to that, uh, to that chapter. I'm not going to go through that whole chapter, but there's only one thing that, he, that I jumped, apart from all the other things that I've talked about here some other time. He, the Hebrew, first of all, the serpent, you know, the serpent is wisdom. Wisdom in the text, in the text, you know. Now the same word, it is arum. That is the word. So if you want to check the Hebrew, it is arum. Now that same word arum is used for nakedness. So when they found that they were naked, it was arum. And nakedness is transparency. Nakedness is that wisdom where you've recognized who you are. 
And here's where I jumped. And when he when he told me, you know, when they when they ate that fruit, you remember, their eyes were opened. Remember that? Remember that? You know what that means in the Hebrew? They were enlightened. That's the word. That's the word. And enlightenment comes from knowledge and consciousness. Knowledge and consciousness in the Bible, the third chapter of Genesis. And we could kind of, you know, go on and on. So he was excited, I was excited, because he was also coming from his tradition. You know, whether the serpent is bad, the serpent is evil. I said, hold on, let's look at the text. So we talked about the text, because the serpent was never looked upon as Satan until the 5th century. Till the 5th five, century, the serpent was a symbol of wisdom. Why? Because in the first five centuries, Christianity was in the Middle East. And we, even today, we worship the serpent. We worship the cobra. Because the serpent is a symbol of wisdom. Is wisdom. So, because the serpent attracts us and draws us to knowledge and consciousness. What is sin, by the way? What is sin? in Hinduism and in Eastern tradition is when I forget who I am. So sin, okay, sin, if you want a technical word, sin is avidya. Avidya, vidya is knowledge. Avidya is ignorance, no knowledge. And what is knowledge? Knowledge is to find the essence. Essence. What is the essence? I find my identity in the divine and interconnectedness of all of life. The divine essence is in every creature, every creature. And the whole of creation is the divine essence. And by the way, before you kind of sit and, and make, me, make us feel like we are pantheists, St. Ignatius, you know, I'm so glad I was a Jesuit for 47 years. So, I love Ignatius. Ignatius is the one who said, in his, and he's put it down in writing. The more mature in the spiritual life will constantly contemplate, meditate and contemplate how God our Lord is present in every creature by his power, presence and essence. So the divine essence is in every creature. The whole of creation is charged with the grandeur of God. Yes. Uh, uh, no, that's not Teat. That is Jared Manley Hopkins. Oh, Jared Man but right. Teat talked about the divine milieu. Yes. It's the same. Okay. So, the, uh, so Teat also talked about the whole, the whole world is his cathedral. Jared Manley Hopkins talked about the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Okay. So when we said it, we were called pantheists. When Ignatius says it, it becomes a mystic. <laughs> but, but part of part of part of the Eastern Eastern spirituality and the Eastern approach to life, everything is sacred. Everything is holy. We have no dichotomy between religion and life. Everything is sacred. Everything. So no one will start any business unless they have made their puja. Even if they are sitting on the streets, in the dirt, they will not sell you anything until they have finished, like, you know, their dedication of the day to God. For the Hindus, in the Eastern tradition, the first moment of the day is extremely important, is dedicated to God. They always begin with their dedication to God. Now, again, and in India, we bathe, not because it's hot, but that is part of that purification. So even if it is like the water is dirty, like you go to the Ganges, they say the Ganges are so dirty that either it's so holy that nobody dies, or it's so dirty that no germs can, you know, can survive. <laughs> so people still, so the Ganges is, so rivers, water is holy. Okay, so our whole life, there is no separation 
between religion and life. All right. So when I find, so what is the goal of life? The goal of life in Hinduism and the Eastern tradition is to find my identity in that divine essence that has been poured out into all of creation. Everything is sacred. So therefore we need to have reverence for everything. You know, for the creatures, for animals, for people, and for everybody there's reverence. But what is reverence, by the way? Again, you know, since you know, there are Christians over here, I'd like to go back to St. Ignatius. The one attitude that Ignatius has is acatamiento. Acatamiento is that reverence. Reverence. In fact, at the end of his life, Ignatius said, you know, God gave me a grace that was above all the other graces that I've received in my entire life. And that grace was acatamiento, reverence. And what is reverence? What is acatamiento? Acatamiento is emptying myself in order to be filled with the divine self. So if I have reverence for you, you know, I'm emptying myself so that the two of us can be in this intimate, connected union. So when we talk about hope and healing, hope and healing comes with reverence. And that reverence is part of the Eastern tradition, is part of the Ignatian tradition, you know. So, and reverence is, see there's a difference between respect and reverence. I can have respect for someone, but just because you have the power, you know. But if I have reverence for you, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in a relationship with you. So reverence is like the, the response to this union and communion with the divine and the interconnectedness of all of life. Okay, so this is the goal. Now, by the way, this goal is not attained. You're saying, now what should I do to kind of, no, it's, and then I'm going to do this and this and this and then I'll, no. You, you, you have all those exercises not to attain, but to realize. To realize that we are already there. We are already in the divine. We are already part of the universe. So the goal of life is just to wake up. You know, get these, like these scales from our eyes to drop. To eat that forbidden fruit and be enlightened. To recognize that we already are divine. We are already divine. You know, and in the divine essence. So that is the strength, the wealth of, uh, uh, you know, the Eastern tradition. Which, by the way, you know, when the Jesuits came about four or five hundred years ago, they baptized us, and you know, and those of us who didn't, didn't get baptized, they killed us. So, but luckily for us, they were so much in a hurry to baptize everybody that they forgot to convert us. <laughs> So we have about three to five thousand years of spiritual tradition that is deep and that is beautiful and that is powerful. So if I only scratch my surface, I get into this universal Eastern spirituality, which, by the way, does not contradict the Christian church or the Christian spirituality. It does not, it has never contradicted my way of understanding, expressing, uh, expressing and living the Catholic faith. In fact, the Eastern tradition gave me words, gave me a way of understanding the Catholic mysteries and of living out my Catholic faith in a more creative and a more effective and a meaningful way. You know, nobody there was no Hindu, no Buddhist, no Muslim, no one wanted me to convert. But as we interacted with one another, we helped one another to live the best lives that we could live in our own religious and spiritual tradition. Okay? So that's like, that is the overall thing that I will come back to again and again in all the different Eastern traditions that we will talk about in, in the next uh, three sessions. 
So the next time I'd like to do like you know the Buddhist pathway. And the time after that, I like to do the Islamic pathway. You know, Islam is one of my favorite things to talk about because it has been so misunderstood in this culture. Thank, thanks to a group of men or a group of people that has given, and of course the media just jumps on that and has destroyed the whole, but Islam is beautiful. In fact, Islam comes from the word peace. So we'll talk about hope and healing, the Islamic way, and that will be the third. And the last one I'd like to do, Taoism, you know, the Taoist tradition, and how we can use a Taoist tradition to uh, develop hope and healing. Okay? But Hinduism is the foundation of all these Eastern traditions. All right, so that's the ultimate goal. Now we've got four proximate goals to help us to reach the ultimate goal. And that, the, the, so the, the four proximate uh, uh, goals are dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So these are, what is dharma? Dharma is, has got two meanings. One is dharma stands for religion. So all of us need religion as a well, like Meister Eckhart told us, you know, writes the mystic, all of us need religion as a well to take us to the ocean of God's love and God's life. Okay, so religion is a means, we need that well to take us to the ocean of God's love and God's life. Now unfortunately, most religions, most religions, like the ones in charge of that religion, don't show us the ocean. They keep us in the well. Tell us how wonderful our well is. Our well is like nobody else's well. <laughs> then they fortify it with, you know, with theologies and encyclicals and dogmas. And they beautify it with, be uh, with, with liturgies, incense and bells and, you know, all. And they, I said, what about the ocean? What about God? So, I tell people, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen all the time, but, okay, here's the difference once again between East and West, and, and that, when in the, in the West, generally, generally, people go to church and go to places where they're welcome and they know people. Because that community is very important. And I've heard people that say, oh, I don't go to that church because I don't, nobody, they never welcome me. And I, I, go, I don't go to the other one because, you know, I go to this church because they're there. Like Walmart greeting you. <laughs> Welcome. And they make you feel at home, you know, which is great, which is great. When I was at, you know, living at Jesuit Hall at, um, and the college church, they, they, you know, you had the 1030 masses, students masses, and you know that, they'd all come arm in arm, hand in hand, your friends, my friends, they all go to church. And as soon as they go there, the first thing, there's a group hug, you know. Then a sign of peace, another group hug. End of mass, one more group hug, and out they go. They can, and they say, beautiful liturgy. And I would ask my students, did you meet God in that liturgy? Did you see the face of God? Or it was just your friends that made you feel so good to be there. Now, I'm not saying your friends cannot help you to see God, but is that why you went to church? Because in the East, by the way, we don't go to church for the community. In fact, the fewer people we know, the better we pray. When I was growing up, my family never went to church as a family. My father went to the first mass, my mother took my sister and went, my brother went on his own, I was on my own. But we all came, because my dad went to church, and we all went to church, to meet God, not the community. To meet God, not the community. Okay, but here's the danger, you know, not because like, I don't know, we Easterners are better, no. The danger could be, yes, so I went to meet God, and that was the end of my story. The question is, after you've met God, the test is, how do you relate to the rest of the community? When you come home, what is your relationship with the rest of the community? Now, my father, when he came home after church, he went every day for Mass. And I told some of you, you know, when I would celebrate Mass at home as a priest, you know, that was not good enough for him. He had to go to church and come back. <laughs> so, but when he came back home, 
He always came home as a better father, a better husband, and a wonderful person in the neighborhood. He influenced the neighborhood, he influenced the world just by his presence because he had seen the face of God and came back. My father never talked much. But you know, when he walked around the neighborhood, people would stand out and, and they noticed him. And they were affected by his goodness. They could sense and feel the presence and the power of God just by looking at him. In fact, the day the, when he died, people came to the funeral and said, we missed him yesterday because he would take his evening walk. Now, of course, this is not Kirkwood where you have nobody like, you know, that walks on the street. There, there are like millions of people that walk at the same time, but they missed my father. Why? He went to church. He had, the, he had an experience of God. He came back and that experience spread wherever he went. Okay, so my mother was the same. My mother, when she came back, she was like a Christian like nobody else was, in like, like, like 10,000 times better than I was. Because she would welcome anybody. Her heart went out to the world. You know, why? Because she went to church, she met God, and that overflowed in the rest of the, you know, the rest of the community. I'm not saying it happens everywhere, but there's just a difference. Community is important, but does your community help you to experience God? You know, like the Jewish rabbi was saying, for us Jews, community is vital. I kind of was thinking about that, because he said, I cannot think about, he said, we cannot think about a Jewish group without community. And I was wondering, I said, well, maybe because, I don't know. They're a minority, and so you need, you know, security in community. I don't know, but it is part of the tradition. Community is, but in the Indian tradition, in the Eastern tradition, we have communion more than community. Now Saint Ignatius, he didn't have an idea of community at all. In fact, he did not want community. You know, he wanted people to come together only to get out. But what he wanted was communion. That whatever happened to one of the Jesuits in any part of the world, it was as if all of us were affected by it. Good and bad. So we had communion, you know, but not community. So that was Ignatius and that is Eastern. So Eastern is, again, you know, in the East when we were growing up, anybody could spank us because we belong to the community. My little nephew, when he was like, you know, two or three years old, he fainted, he passed out. The neighbor's child just picked him up and took him to the hospital. And my sister and his mother didn't know which hospital he had taken them. <laughs> and they're running in, in a cab to three or four different hospitals. And he lands in the hospital, a doctor saying, how are you related? He said, it doesn't matter, treat him. Yeah. And he took care of him. Because that child doesn't belong to the family, belongs to the community. Yes, we have parents. But I got spanked and I got punished by a lot of people who are not my parents and I dared not come home and tell my parents <laughs> because I would get... So that's community for us is everywhere. Now where do we get it? So when you go to church, when you go to pray, you don't go to, like in the East, we go there to meet God and that overflows into community. In the West, generally, you know, you need community in order to be able to experience God. Okay? So that's one of the one of those big differences. So religion for us is very individual. You know, it's very individual. Uh, like you go to the temple whenever you want, and uh, you know, there was a tribe in the, the tribal communities in the north of India. And so of course the missionaries went and baptized them and made them Catholic. So one time the missionary was telling this guy, he said, I never see you in church. He said, oh, my brother goes. Which means one representative of the church goes there, brings the blessing home. Why should all of us go there? <laughs> and wonderful. So today you go, tomorrow you go. Like you serve. But, so you go there to bring the blessing and bring it back home. So we have different ideas of, you know, of, of really 
uh, living our spiritual our spiritual life. So religion is important, but it's only a means. Religion is not an end in itself. It's a means to deepen, to help us to reach the divine essence. The divine essence. You know? So, of course, one of the questions I've always asked myself is this. Once you've reached the ocean, do you still need the well? You know, and that's a question I'm not going to answer because I don't know the answer. You know, you say yes and no. How much do you really need the well when you're in the ocean? You know, or do you still need to feel connected? Or do you feel lost without the well? So in the East, we get rid of the well and we become universal. Okay, I'll come quickly to that part. Um, I'll go a little quick. So, okay, then the dharma, besides religion, also means duty. So we have our duties. So as a child, as a as a as a as a parent, so we all have you have duties that you got to fulfill. And I'll come to that duty part. The next is dharma artha. Artha is wealth. Now, in the Eastern spirituality, wealth is good. Money is good. Okay, it's good. It's, and, and not only it's good, it is your duty to earn enough money. Because when you have enough money, then you can pursue the goals of your life. When you have enough money, you can help your family, your loved ones, your neighbor, and everybody else to be able to, to, to attain the goal of their life. So money is good, wealth is good. Now wealth, by the way, is not only money. Wealth is also my qualities, my talents, and my gifts. I need to celebrate my talents, my gifts. You know? The thing is, again, when I was growing up as a Catholic, and we came, when I was 12 years old, you know, God has been so wonderful in my life that doesn't stop surprising me. We moved from very Catholic ghetto, you know, little place, to this environment, a new place, because my father was working for the government then, so we had quarters. We were only four Christian families among all these 200 other families. Most of them were Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, etc. You know, and I looked around and I said, you know, this was before Vatican II. Um, I looked at them, like when I introspected, what was the, what was the end result when I looked into myself? Confession. Confession, because I saw sin, I saw ugliness, I saw all my defects, I saw everything negative, I needed confession. When a Hindu introspected, what did the Hindu find? God. Aham Brahmasmi. I am part of the divine. So their introspection was a celebration of their relationship with the divine. My introspection was Confession, because we call it a celebration of reconciliation, but it is, but it was, it was confession, it was penance, okay? So as I noticed all these different things. When we went to, when we went to church, most of our things were like those 40 days of Lent. We're kind of pretty miserable, you know, we're hard. Hinduism, 330 million gods, they were singing, dancing, food, movies, a celebration of God, celebration of life. So we looked around and we said, oh, this, this is very different. You know, not that Jesus would not, did not sing and dance, but we don't allow Jesus to sing and dance anymore. We put him on the cross and like, you know, and that we've, we've ruined his life and our life forever. You know? I do believe that we need to get that cross down and replace it with the resurrection at least for a little, for a long time, you know. That is colonial, you know, the cross. Not that we don't have crosses in our lives, but that cross keeps us stuck. We need hope. We need the resurrection. We need to be the Easter, Pentecost, Ascension people. So Easter is not the end. There's Pentecost. Pentecost is not the end. There is the Ascension. The ascension is not the end. There's a greater way of living life. Don't get stuck and don't, don't limit. Don't let your religion limit you. You know, and I'm saying this is part of Christianity. This is part of Jesus. We need to be able to celebrate God, celebrate life. 
So in the East, yes, religion is celebration. So art is wealth, but art is also meaning, meaning. Okay, so one of the things that is important, uh, one of the duties that we have is to find the meaning of my life. Who am I and what is, you know, what is the meaning and the mission of my life? Who am I and what is the purpose of my life? Who am I and why have I been put into this, on this earth? There's been a mission. And what, I, what God has put me into to do over here, nobody else can do it. So I've got to find what is my mission, what is my meaning in this life. Uh, then karma. So dharma the karma. What is karma? Karma Sutra. Pleasure. Pleasure is duty. So if you want to attain the heights of spirituality, you've got to learn how to enjoy pleasure. Pleasure is a must. So at the end of our lives, we will be judged on the legitimate pleasures of life that we have not enjoyed, says the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that we will be judged on the legitimate pleasures of life that we haven't enjoyed. So heaven is pleasure. And so therefore, like, you know, and pleasure doesn't mean rip, you've got to go and the, to the most expensive things. No, pleasure is in the little things of life. St. Ignatius, at the end of his life, what was his pleasure? Four roasted chestnuts. He would ask for them, just to enjoy them. So he enjoyed pleasure till he died. Yes, so if you, <laughs> like I said, you know, it is legitimate pleasures. Joe will tell you that if you go to Ted Drew's, if you have anything more than the smallest portion that they sell, you're not having pleasure. <laughs> There's a special place in hell reserved for you because that's, <laughs> it goes beyond enjoying, relishing, savoring pleasure. Okay? So pleasure is an important part of, of, of the Eastern tradition. You know, Ramadan, the Muslims have just broken their fast. How do they break their fast every day in Ramadan? By having something sweet, a date, so that they can taste the sweetness of God and the sweetness of life, pleasure. So legitimate pleasure is a must in order to be able to attain, uh, you know, the realization of God. And finally, moksha. Moksha is freedom. And in the East, it is not freedom from suffering, sickness, and death. But it's a freedom that you experience in suffering, in sickness, and in the face of death. How many of you have seen Slumdog Millionaire? Okay, did you see any unhappy faces there? In that pain, in that squalor, in that dirt, in, that, in the struggles of life, they were free. They were free. You know, one time my friend, you know, the Jesuit companion of mine, I told you about the guy who was tortured and beheaded. So he and I were walking through the mountains one time, and a train passed. And on top of the train was this homeless guy. You know, he is like his shirt was torn, his pants were falling down, and he was on the top of the train dancing. And of course, he and I were working for justice. He and I were kind of, you know, were there. And I said, and we are working to free that guy? <laughs> I mean, just see how happy he is. You know, how happy he is. I just heard a comedian today who said, you know, in, in, in India, we don't have homeless people. Because who is homeless? Those who had a home and have lost their home. What we call homeless in India were born on the streets and they're always on the streets. That's their home. And they don't complain. You know, the guy who says, but you know, you don't have any shoes. He said, yeah, but that fellow doesn't have feet. I at least got my feet. And you go to the guy who says, oh, you don't have any feet. He said, yeah, but that guy doesn't have any legs. So they are, you know, we've learned to be able to be free in suffering, in sickness, and in the face of death. So there is a resilience that comes from the spirituality and freedom that we find in this 
collective unconsciousness where we experience the divine essence in each one of us. Okay? All right. So, after that, I like to talk about, uh, well, there are four stages in life. The four stages in life is Brahmacharya, Krahasthya, Vanaprastha, Sanyas. So, these are four, what is Brahmacharya? It's a student life. Now, this is important because I told you that Eastern tradition is pilgrimage. So there's a student life. What happens in the student life? We are introduced to the divine, to God and the ways of God. So traditionally, the student is introduced to scriptures and to God. You know, so we are put on that pathway of the divine. Now, Brahmacharya is also celibacy. You know, a celibate is called a Brahmacharya. So during, the, I, t I tell my students, I said, as long as you're a student, you're celibate, they said, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, so, but yes, why? Because your, all, your, all your pleasure, all your enjoyment, all your focus is on finding your identity on this, in your pathway, in your relationship with God. Now, once you finish the student life, and normally, traditionally, you know, students are taken to a teacher in the village, in the, you know, in a, a different place. And the teacher initiates, this, uh, initiates the students into wisdom. You know, their knowledge is wisdom. Pass on the wisdom that has been, that they have got from generation to generation. Now, once you've finished your student life, then you have Grahaste. Grahaste is a householder. So, it's, you start a family life or you begin to take responsibility for a group, for people, etc. So you have duties there, you know, to be able to provide for everybody, okay, to have children, to raise them. But after you finish that, this is where I'm, where I'm talking about the other two that, you know, where the Eastern tradition helps us to, to, to keep moving in our spiritual life. And this whole thing of hope and healing, the third stage is Vanaprastha, is the forest dweller. But what happens in the, in the forest dweller, people kind of now, the younger generation takes over the household work. You know, the banking and the, and the, and the, and the, and, and the, everything in the house like is taken care of by the children. And so the, the parents kind of withdraw. Traditionally, they would leave the house and go to the forest and join a little ashram, join a little group of people where they will spend time in prayer and meditation. Doing what? Now, trying to grapple with the existential questions. Who am I? What is my life all about? Where am I going from here? And then they would, the final stage would be sannyas. Sannyas would be when you leave your, your spouse and then you're on your own. Then you're on your own. Now that's ascension. I'm not saying like, you know, leave your spouse and leave, like, you know, and go, but there is a certain amount and well, sooner or later, one of, the, one of the spouses dies and you are left alone. You know, you are left alone. But then you're on that journey, that final journey of now becoming universal. Now you don't belong to your family. You don't belong to your culture and your, and your country. You become a universal person in that fourth stage. In fact, you don't have your identity anymore as, you don't, you're, you're, it's a different name. You know, so you become, you become a universal, so these are four stages. So we need to be able to think, you know, when you're talking about hope and healing, to slowly start, because in this culture we are told we'll never die. You know, so we've got to keep going. Yes, keep going, but in what way? Here's the thing, I was talking to somebody just today, and, uh, you know, I told you about pleasure, pleasure, like, like he was grappling with this whole thing about, I cannot do what I used to do like, you know, like five years ago. Because he was a biker, you know, and on this bike trip, like he was like one of those that always be, and you know, he was there with the professional bikers, and, but this time he went to, like he was trying to keep up, and he, was, <laughs> he, he couldn't, like, you know, he couldn't keep up, and I'm saying, okay, you know, be like a good athlete. Like a good athlete needs to know when to quit. And you need to quit while you're still ahead. Don't come for an exhibition game like you know when you're 10 years after you've retired because people don't want to remember that. Quit while you're ahead. 
This is what I did. When I was, I was an athlete, enjoyed being an athlete, when I finished, then I started coaching. Then I trained other people. And when you finish coaching, now you become an expert commentator. Like, you know, you become <laughs> like, you know. So there are these phases, there are these stages which are very healthy. The second thing I want to tell you is this, which I told him also. Enjoy what you're doing at every moment of your life. Because when it is taken away from you, or you cannot do it anymore, you will not miss it at all. You will not miss it. So that is part of the Indian tradition, that every stage of your life, enjoy it fully. Because when it's gone, you won't miss it. My parents, you know, my, my, stu my students get shocked and I say, you know, my parents both died and I don't miss them at all. I don't. Because I've enjoyed them. I've enjoyed them. Of course, if I really want to get their attention, I say, I'm glad that my parents are dead. Because they have given me time to be able to take in and be grateful and live out all the gifts that they've given me. It's not because I don't love them. Because I love them. Because I love them. And death is part of life. If I was able, if I could, like, you know, by holding on to them, I was neither doing them a favor nor doing myself a favor. But I've enjoyed my parents while I had them, so I don't miss them. You know, similarly, like I said, I was an athlete. Do I miss, like, in front of them? No. I mean, I have my bicycle, I'll go. In the beginning, when I, I was on my bike, yes, every little hill, I go, so I got up and I would walk. You know, people would look at me and say, oh, this guy from India. I don't care. You know, now today I can go a little faster, but I, no, I mean, I enjoy what I'm doing. And I don't miss anything. I told you I was a Jesuit for 47 years. Trust me, I enjoyed being a Jesuit, and I don't miss being a Jesuit anymore. Not because it was bad, but it was good. And I enjoyed it, so I don't miss it. You know, I started different places, different things. Enjoyed it. If it collapses, nobody cares about it, I don't care. Because when I was there, I did the best that I could, and I can move on. That's part of the, not the journey, but the pilgrimage. The pilgrimage is learning how to let go in order to go to the next step. Like, don't carry this journey, like, don't... You know, the raft that brought you from one stage to the other stage, you don't need it for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for your future stages. So don't carry it around because it looks, it, 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 it is, it's, not, it's not good. See what I'm saying? You know? So if the raft brought you here, again, there was one of these Indian gurus, and one of his disciples came to him and said, you know, all these prayers that I used to say that sustain me all my life, I cannot pray anymore. Somehow there is no, I don't have that any, you know, it, it does, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. All those other rituals that I had, so the guy asked him, how did you come here? I like this man, he's dead, but you know, he died, but, but he, was, he was very simple down to earth. So the guy told him, I took a train, really, and what happened to the train? He said, well, I got off the, uh, got off the, uh, the station, and then the train went, you know, continued the journey. He said, how did you come from the, train, from the station here? He said, I, I came on a bullock cart, on an ox cart, you know. And he said, then what happened to the cart? He said, well, it went back. He said, that's your spiritual life. All your practices, everything that you did, brought you here. Now you don't need it. Let go. The cart brought you here. And it went. Now you need to go to the next step. So what is it that you and I are holding on to that is not letting us go to the next person? So the student has got to give up in order to be a householder. Parents have got to give up family life in order to look for the existential questions of life. Then, once you reach there, you've got to give that up in order to become universal. In this lifetime, don't wait to die in order to attain it because it's already given. We are already in the ocean. We need to be able to wake up and be able to, you know, to... It's like the Buddha story. I anticipate this, I'm going to tell it to you again. Who cares? But you know, it's that story of the little wave. 
You know the story of the little wave, that when it was coming to the, all these waves were coming towards the shore, and the little wave panicked and was screaming and shouting, and the bigger wave said, what's going on? He says, can't you see we are all going to die? And the big wave said, oh little wave, you're not just a wave, you're part of the ocean. You're not just a wave, you're part of the ocean. You and I are not just little individuals. We are part of the ocean of God's love, God's life. We, we have arrived. Don't wait to die, you know, in order to... Because half of you, I'm sure, when you, when you die, you're wondering whether, you know, you've got Peter there, with that scales and the book of life. That's an invention of human beings. There is no scales and there is no book of life. There is God who loves us totally and unconditionally, who is waiting for us to who is waiting to celebrate us. Without that thing, that wonderful thing of particular judgment and final judgment, which is an invention. That's not the God of the Eastern tradition. The God of the Eastern tradition is a God of celebration. Is a God of life. And you can celebrate it in this life. You don't have to wait for the next life. Okay, so those are the four stages. And then uh, I, want to, I want to stop here and just, how about we stop here and let's have a little conversation. Yeah. Some I questions. Love, I just love the way you think. <laughs> You'll get into trouble, be careful. <laughs> so we'll record questions. Anybody? Okay, yeah. so this way, speak into that, that okay. we'll record it, we'll get it. I, in Christianity, the idea of original sin is an invention. Uh, I did hear a rabbi say that we're um, made in the image of God, so you're looking at the positive, and you said when you introspect, you thought of your negative yeah. sense. <coughs> I also think that original sin is another invention. I don't know what original sin is except that it is original. But, uh, and when you talk about sin, see, original sin is simply like, you know, just forgetting about who I am. That's original sin. When I forget who I am, you know, then I'm in sin. Um, what's the other thing I wanted to say? Oh, in the East, in Hinduism, in the East, the biggest sin you can commit is to call another human being a sinner. The biggest sin you can commit, the greatest sin you can commit is by calling another human being a sinner. Why? Who am I? I'm not this body. I'm not my emotions. I'm not even what I do. That is the me. My essence is divine. My essence is that. And so if you call me a sinner, you're insulting God. Okay? So that original sin, like, you know, even in the, like in the Eastern tradition, original sin is ignorance. Avidya. How, you, how do you overcome original sin? By vidya, knowledge. And what is knowledge? Knowledge is, like, my essence. Okay? And the essence of life. Okay? Anybody else? Yes? Yes. Well, with that last statement, you just about wiped out the precepts or concepts of the Catholic religion because it's based on original sin. And yeah. because everything has to start with the baptism which erases it. So if you haven't been baptized, you know, where's your essence? <laughs> okay, that's that's a good that's a good that's a good question. So you have to be baptized, but what is baptism? There are three kinds of baptism. There's water, there is spirit, and there's fire. So, original sin is like when you're baptized in water. Yes, water is uh, uh, and like, you know, see, a symbol of purification. Water is a symbol of life. And in Carl Jung's, you know, say, archetypes, water is also part of the collective unconsciousness. So when you get baptized in water, you get baptized into the collective unconsciousness of this community. So you inherit the whole history and the mystery, the ups, the downs of this community. But you cannot stop there. Then you've got to have the water of, or the baptism of spirit. 
And the baptism of the Spirit is to have the same experience that Jesus had when he was baptized, when the heavens opened and God's voice was heard, my beloved, I'm pleased with you, my favor rests on you, my delight is in you. Now, do you have to be a Christian to be baptized in the Spirit? No. Did Paul baptize in water? No. In fact, Paul said, I'm not called to, be, to baptize people. I've been set aside to preach the good news. Did Jesus baptize? John the Baptist tells us he didn't baptize with water, but he's going to baptize us with spirit and fire. Now, what is fire baptism? The baptism of fire, I used to say before in the past, was the baptism of martyrdom, where you paid the price for your, you know, for, for your faith. But today I believe the baptism of fire is when you're so purified in the crucible of God's life and God's love that you don't need structures anymore. Baptism of fire is to reach the highest stage in Hinduism, where you become one with the universe. You become one with the divine. You, that, that becomes your way of life. Okay? So don't get so original. Okay, the, the other thing about original sin again is based on the third chapter of Genesis, the fall of Adam and Eve. So we need to understand what is the fall of Adam and Eve. In Paul, we have both disobedience, but also knowledge. The fall of Adam and Eve is ignorance. They didn't know who they were. And when they ate that fruit, thanks to the serpent, who <laughs> invited them to wisdom, their eyes were opened. And they had knowledge and consciousness. They ate of the tree of knowledge. And they had consciousness. Now you also know that in the Jewish tradition, there are two trees. Of course, this rabbi didn't know about that part. He says, you know more about... I said, no, no, I read all these crazy things. But here's, <laughs> but here's the thing from this, you know, India. If this is the Jewish myth, and I can give it to you. I can give you the reference. Where they say in the Garden of Eden there are two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And the tree of life is surrounded by the tree of knowledge. The goal of life is to reach the tree of life, but the path to the tree of life is by coming again and again and eating the forbidden fruit of knowledge and consciousness. But they said, be careful, because every time you touch the tree of knowledge and consciousness, you will be alienated, made to suffer, and punished by the people who love most. I told you, like, you know, that I tell my, when I tell my students this, here there is only, like, you know, just one color thing, or maybe one or two colors. I tell my students, I said, what if, or oh, I'm telling you, my students, they get enlightened, and one of your daughters or sons is in my class, and they come for to Thanksgiving with this wonderful African-American guy, or a guy from India and says, Hey mom, look what I found. <laughs> Thanksgiving, everybody's there and they say, Oh dear. Moms, of course, like, you know, they get over it. Fathers, I told you, find it very difficult, but they are very, they, they got no courage to express their, how they feel. So what will they say? Think about grandma. You're going to kill her. <laughs> bring grandma in just so that you know. But grandma will be fine. You have a problem. You cannot deal with that. So, so yes, original sin needs to be, so it is disobedience, obedience. So therefore, what is the whole purpose of Jesus? So the purpose of Jesus is either to work with the obedience or he came to give us life, life in all its fullness. He came to give us knowledge. Did Jesus die for our sins? Yes, he did. But what is sin? When we forget who we are, then we are in sin. And Jesus came to give tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, and everybody that was condemned by society and religion their identity. He got them out of sin by telling them who they were. Image of God, likeness of God, breath of God, you are gods, you are divine. St. Paul would tell us, you know, I love Paul. Uh, I mean, you know, there are parts of Paul that are very kind of cultural, and so don't kill him just because of a few things that, and that also because you want to, just because he's a man. Yes, he, 
yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> like Paul will say in Galatians 4, 4 to 7, you know, if you call God, if God is Father, Abba Father, the Spirit helps us to call God Abba Father. If God is Father, you're children of God. And if you're a child of God, you're a divine heir. And as an heir of God, as an heir of God, like Hinduism, you know, the gifts and graces of God are not your, not your, not your privilege, but your right. Everything that God has and everything that God possesses and everything that God is belongs to you as a right, not a privilege. As a right, not a privilege. You know, God is ours and God and we are God's. We are like tattooed on God and God has tattooed on us. We, we are inseparable. So that's original sin for me. So original sin is not kind of, not the other part about the judgment and all that, like I, that's okay. We can get rid of that. Yeah. Because first of all, Peter did not know how to read and write and he cannot count. So if he's looking at that, he knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, when you talked about the four stages and the forest dwellers, uh -huh. you just talk more about that. That's kind of an interesting phase since I'm in that age range. <laughs> See, the forest dweller doesn't mean that you, like, you know, that you have to go to the forest. But a forest dweller now is like you'll spend less and less time on all those mundane things. But you spend more and more time becoming more introspective, you know, and asking questions. Now, people are afraid to introspect and ask questions, you know, and so therefore they have to work, 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 work till they, you know, they'll, they'll die working. Yeah, I'll die working too, but you know, but it's my, but my work is a different kind of work. I do spend time just take my bike, go alone, like, you know, just today, I didn't like, I also just, went out just was by myself and my mind is constantly I sit there in my in my little house and I look at the birds. You know, the little squirrel, the chipmunk comes and we have a conversation. You know, because we are interconnected. But I'm asking myself questions. My mind never stops. But that's thanks to the gift that my father gave me, the question, question, question. So at this stage of your life, you need to be able to say, All right. You know, the Cardinals can win, the Cardinals can lose. Oh. <laughs> I knew I would get you there. <laughs> so, now I mean, I can cheer for anybody. And yes, I'm not going to get so upset if they're, because there, is, there, is, there are greater things in life than whether the Cardinals win or lose, or whether one team win or, or the elections come or the elections go. Don't you waste your energy on that. You know, don't waste your energy on that. The elections are important, but don't like, like, you know, like, no, learn how to be, you know, like objective, you flow with that, you know the issues, and you know, like Mahatma Gandhi, invite, engage, conversation, that, and you know, conversations, not debates, not arguments, not like, you know, so that's, so, so anything. So I'm saying, like, you know, I look at, I look, I, I have followed the, the things that are happening in the world. Yes, am I affected by it? Yes, but I also know there is something more than that is what is happening and what is, yes, I, I get affected by it. I'm not saying I'm neutral. I'm not saying that, you know, like if, a, if, if somebody is raped and somebody is kind of, you know, is murdered, doesn't mean that I'm not, I don't feel that pain, but I don't, I know that I can, like, you know, I'm part of that pain and I'm looking for the resurrection. It's not an escape, but it's working through it. It's working through it. I'm, I don't speak well. I here, worked with the concept of wanderer. Is that another way of expressing the fourth and what you just expressed to him? Yes. Like when we talked about the hero's journey, you know, the wanderer. Like you start with the innocent, then the orphan, then the warrior, and the martyr, and then you come to the wanderer stage, that's the stage of the, the forest dweller. And then you become the magician, which is sannyas, then you become universal. Okay. 
when my husband and I were both students at the University of Missouri, we took fundamental moral and religious values and then comparative religions to try to establish what we believed. And what it ended up doing was making us so confused that we just gave up on all of it. After listening to you tonight, we should have held on to what we were learning and tried to see how it tied all together instead of well, which one are we going to choose? And if I come home and said I'm going to be a Hindu, I would be out in the street. <laughs> but if now I would say to my granddaughter, you know, I'm picking up some ideas from Hinduism, she would celebrate with me. There's a difference. Yes. Yes. These uh, your grandchildren's race are hopeless. <laughs> no, but they are more, you know what, people kind of complain about, like, you know, like the, like the youth of today, they have no religion, they have no this. The youth of today are more spiritual than many of us are. So they have a spirituality that sustains them, you know, like they're not so, like religion does not attract them as much as, I'm not saying that, so don't so give up religion. No, I'm not saying that, you know. Like, um, you know, my students would say, like, you know, I would ask them, so why are you taking this course that I'm teaching? Oh, born Catholic, raised Catholic, tired of being Catholic, so I'm here. I said, I have news for you. All my students go back to church for a different reason. For a different reason, you know. So I encourage people, yes, to, like, you do need religion, you do need, but you got to, like, like, church is boring, but you need to find your own meaning in that, you know, wherever you go. So, yes. When I was teaching at St. Louis University, you know, parents and grandparents would ask their students, is he really Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> now, coming from India, yeah, you can be a Hindu and a Catholic at the same time, no problem. Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, yes? I just, um, what do you think in terms of taking um, drugs to get this higher um, sense of... <laughs> no, I don't need drugs to get. <laughs> no, I I would rather kind of no, I no no no. <laughs> so what drugs are you on? <laughs> uh, I like you to talk more about the fourth stage, please. All right, so that's good. So talk about the fourth stage. So the. <laughs> We talk about the third stage. By the way, if anybody needs to leave, just feel free and like you know helps. Uh, I will we'll go on for another 15, 20 minutes and then we'll kind of will stop. Uh, the fourth stage, like you know, sannyas. Like I can talk about my father and my mother who had reached the fourth stage. Now, did they kind of separate from one another? No, they didn't. Even when they were there together, they were at that fourth stage where, like, our friends. Like the best friends that we had at home were Hindus and Muslims. So if anything happened to anybody at home, you know, there was the Muslim family that would come to help us or the Hindu family would come to us. So we made no differences between Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists. We made no differences you know, between, they made, sorry, they made no differences between people on, at their funeral. Not only like, you know, the people in stretch limousines, like my sister's boss and office people came, but all the street people came for, you know, to, what do you call it, to their funeral. Why? Because they had reached now this universal. Uh, and at the end of his life, like my father, who went every day to church, and sometimes maybe twice a day, the last seven or eight years of his life, he didn't go to church. He prayed the rosary every day. You know, but and he was so close to God. He was in that fourth stage where the structures, he didn't need structures of any religion because he belonged to all religions. He was universal, you know. So, but it gives you that inner, that inner peace and inner freedom where you're not afraid. See, you're not afraid to live fully and you're not afraid to die. That's the fourth stage. I'm not saying, like, you know, I want to die because I know, like, a, a friend of mine who has a death wish, that is because he wants to die because he's never lived. And for him, like, you know, his whole, like, like death is an escape from a stupid, silly life that he's lived. And he had all the opportunities, you know, in the world that were given to him, and he has not lived. Whereas, but if you really live your life, 
Then you come to that fourth stage where, you know, if tomorrow you die, yeah, it's good. If you have another day to live, it's wonderful. That inner freedom. Okay. Yes. Where does um, pain and suffering fit into all this? You mentioned the, you know, the, the guy that doesn't have shoes is happy. He's got a foot, and, you know, etc. But. In reality, you know, that's great, but what, in reality, what, uh, what, where does, you know, I'm here for you. Good question. So what, what about, like, you know, it's like pain and suffering? Okay. I will do a little more about this when I'm doing Buddhism, because in Buddhism, which is like founded on Hinduism, you know, pain is a fact of life. Suffering is a state of mind. Two, pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. You know, when a mother gives birth to a child, is it painful? Oh yeah. Is it suffering? When you look back, you don't look at it as suffering. You know, some mothers may still say like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, like pain is a fact of life. You know, like, but I need, I'm not saying what Jesus said and what the Hindus also say. You know, if you are in pain, don't kind of, we don't glorify pain. Go and see a doctor. Go and get the medicine. Do whatever you can, but do it with that inner freedom. That inner freedom. You know, and like, and there's a time will come when you can do nothing. You just... You know, when my mother, I think when I, I started this whole program by talking about my mother, that when she went to Lourdes, she came and she told us she was healed but not cured. Okay, so that's the difference between, so she had the pain, but she stopped suffering. Not because she was, you know, like fatalistic. No, there is a freedom that comes in pain. So like when you have, like, okay, you know, like the economy, is not as good as it used to be maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, so we have a little less to live. Is it painful? Yes. But I can choose to sit down and grumble and complain and like, you know, or just say, okay, it is what it is. Let me see how best I can live with what I have. And so therefore, in this painful situation, I'm still, I'm still free. You know, sickness. If somebody comes down with cancer, is it painful? Of course it is. And the other thing, see, in, like again, you know, I listen to the radio and hear people, they always talk about how people fight cancer. In the East, we journey with cancer. Because when you fight, there are winners and losers. When you journey, there are only winners. Because the journey, it's not that you're, you're, you're resigned, but you, it says an acceptance where you work through it. Okay? So you journey with your sickness, you journey with life, you know, not fight life. But next time, I'll talk. Do you want to be there? <laughs> this is, yeah, if you can, I would talk about how the Buddhists, because the Buddhists have got this tremendous wisdom of how to deal with, because the Buddhists, the Buddha's first act, the first, uh, like, saying, like, you know, the, the, the noble truth is, life is suffering. Suffering has a cause. The cause of suffering, there's a cause in suffering, and there's a way out of suffering. Okay? But then I'll do that the next time. Somebody else had their hand up? <coughs> yes? And is it necessary to go through all four stages of, of life? I think it'd be like, well, who is moms who maybe has young children like her monastery? Are they going through this? Yes. Yes, you do, you do need to go through the, they do go through the four stages. Even the Buddhist monks, they kind of, they go through the, you know, the, the, the monastery. Then they'll, go and get, then they'll go and get married. Then they go out again, and then they ultimately end up again in the monastery, or they end up alone. So it's part of life is also, I mean, just think about it. Even your life and my life, even though we may not be part of the Eastern tradition, yeah, we had our schooling and our education, and now that we, you know, we have this family life or this, you know, we have our responsibilities in society, and then we need to be able to move to the next stage of looking for, you know, it gives us freedom. Because if we keep going back, I'm not saying stop studying, but our study needs now to be more existential rather than, you know, trying to get a degree. You know, like, uh, and then finally look for that freedom. 
where you free. Otherwise, men that are here, you know, most they say many men kind of you know six months after they retire they die. Why? Because for them it is unless you're doing, you think you're not worth anything. You know, so that like women kind of retire a little you know much better than uh, you know one of our. I had a classmate of mine who got married in Hindu tradition. Before they get married, the girls fast for 40 days, you know, like to get a good husband. And and guess what? They also fast for 40 days, and their prayer is that their husband will die before them, <laughs> before they die, it's because they want the husband should not be able to take care of themselves. So this is the gift that they want to give their husbands: <laughs> die before I die. <laughs> Because I'll be able to take care of my life and I'll survive, you will not. So, now, this, now, my father died 12 years after my mother did, so he survived. Yes. Oh, you, you give me the impression that you're uh, a very free man. I want to know, having been what you have been, how did you... Uh, cope with guilt. I think all of us um, <clears throat> are pretty well programmed in the art of being guilty. Wonderful. Uh, after I was ordained, in the, I was in the first community there, and the superior of the community told me, he said, I'm praying for you every day that you'll have some little guilt about some little thing. <laughs> I've been, I mean, that guilt part was when I was in the, you know, in the Catholic kind of, you know, uh, ghetto that I was, that I was, there was only guilt there because I couldn't praise myself, I couldn't appreciate myself, I couldn't see anything good, to, like, you know, so there was guilt there. But God came to my rescue, our rescue, brought us out of that, threw us into this great, and like, uh, uh, into the ocean, you know, where they were, and I looked around and I said, that's why I said, when the Hindu introspects, celebration. When a Catholic introspects, confession. <laughs> so, that's if you want me to know, like, you know, how, that's why I also say, like, you know, that very rarely do I lose sleep at night. Like, I just, I have great sleep, partly because I don't have a conscience, and <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm saying that joking. I, I have a conscience, but it is not a, it is a conscience that has kind of, you know, that has developed and kind of, you know, and I, and I think very differently than I used to think when I was, like, in high school. So, uh, and not that anything goes, you know what I mean? It's like there's, there is, I feel responsible and I do. Yeah, but guilt, no. I mean, I will admit guilt, but I will not feel guilty. So if I've done something wrong, I would say, yes, I'm sorry I did that. But I'm not going to beat my, there's a difference between admitting guilt and any feeling guilty. And sometimes, like, you know, people feel that unless you feel guilty, you know, that you're not sorry. No, I am sorry. I'll do anything, but you're not going to make me feel like, you know, like a worthless person because of what I've done. Okay. Yes, Jim. It fits into this. This morning, I'm in a class with the archdiocese. I'm an archdiocesan employee, and they told us this big wave of Spanish immigration coming to the United States, approximately one-sixth of the people go to communion because they feel they must go to confession before each communion. Now, does that sound like the 50s? And what the process they're having us as educators, we call this Jansenism. The parents are saying, Get to go see the priest before. So what our masses are now doing, 20, 30 minutes before, the little children calling it, Father, I did this, Father, I did this, Father, I did that. The parishes, though, 50 people out of, out of 300 will go to communion. And so in is coming the evangelicals, and they're snatching away our Catholics. So I'm telling you folks, this guilt and this thing and what we're doing here with hope and healing, this applies to us in our schools and that. I just learned that this morning. <clears throat> See also unfortunately, like you know, different parts of the world, the younger guys who are coming out of the seminary are kind of our, our big workshops or warehouses for
churning up more and more guilt. And um, I mean, you know, there was, I mean, here in St. Louis, I won't tell you which parish this was, but one of the young guys got up and said, you know, if you've been living together before you got married, please don't come to me for marriage preparation. You cannot get married in the Catholic Church. Now, the older guy had to get up and say, he says, if you don't go to him, come to me. <laughs> take care of but this is what is said. I mean, you know, this is the young guy who just got out. And now he's saying, if you've been living together, don't come to, don't get married in the Catholic Church. You know, and then, of course, the other guy, whom I was, where I was present, you know, and they were like, most people were in like, you know, 60s and 70s and 80s, like with the church there. And he was talking about using birth control is a mortal sin. <laughs> Unless Angel Gabriel appeared to anybody over there in that church, you know, they would not need birth control. Okay, one last question. Yes. I was just reading, uh, reread an old book from the 60s, uh, and a lot of the things you said today reminded me. Uh, there's Victor Franco wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is pretty Western in many respects, but it also takes off on a lot, especially your stuff on freedom and uh, suffering, the value of suffering, that there is value to it. I don't know if you want to make any kind of comparison or whatever, but it. It's, it was, it's a good book to reread. This is back in the 60s, which is kind of oh, a lot of this stuff started. Yeah, Frankel is kind of, you know, is timeless. And again, maybe to answer your question about pain and suffering again, like Frankel will, will work on that axiom, if you know the why of your life, you can live anyhow. So if you, have a, if you know the why of your life, if you know the meaning and the purpose of your life, you can live any, in any situation. So even if you can survive through the worst, like, uh, you know, the concentration camps, if you have the why, if you know the why of your life. So, so that's the way, you know, in, in India, in the East, and in many places, people survive because, like, deep down they have a why. Yeah, so Franco, I like Franco. Yeah. Yes? Um, I'd just like to say that uh, Jimmy Fallon, when he uh, fell and injured his thumb, he showed that book on TV and said he read it and he recommended it to everybody. It's one of the ten most influential books. Okay. And it'll be coming back. Yeah, I mean, I use it. I use it when in class. You know, one of the required readings is Frankel's Man Search for Me. So it's that because I teach logotherapy too. That's part of my course. The last half, but not very enjoyable. Hey, but the last half of that book. Is yes. Nice. Yes. Anyway, all right, it's 7.30, thank you very much. Okay, we're back here next Monday. We only have a little room. Uh, they're telling me only 50, but the maintenance guys let us set up for 80. And the, the fire marshal says 80. So we had 80 the first time. It being 1 o'clock, probably won't be that crowded, but just to let you know. Next Monday we'll do Buddhism. Thank you very much. One o'clock, Monday, one to three, in the little room next door here. Which Monday? The twenty-seventh. Uh -huh. One to three. Yeah, and the the dates are back there again at that. But please, if you send an email to us, we'll get those out to you. We're trying to figure out what to do for the fall. Thank you.